Rolling. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, and those watching on our Facebook Live uh, page. I'm Gwen Robinson, the president of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand, and uh, we're here tonight to discuss Myanmar's uncertain election and its regional implications. Um, before I turn to that, I'd just like to remind you that we have events coming up, so do look at uh, our website and our Facebook page, but um, notably next week, on Thursday, October 22nd, we are bringing up some uh, artists from Patani in Thailand's Deep South for an event uh, that will uh, put the spotlight on not just the art of the Deep South but the issues uh, amidst a, a very long-running uh, conflict down there. And uh, that will be followed by a panel uh, discussion on the future of uh, Thai contemporary art in the international and national context with a stellar lineup of uh, figures from the art world in Thailand, including the head of the Bangkok Art Biennale, which is about to launch and is one of the only international art festivals that is proceeding in this kind of post-COVID or COVID world. So um, do keep it, do, do try and watch or attend that. It's open to all. And now to the topic of the evening. I'd just like to briefly introduce our panel um, the, who are going to give us their view on this very uncertain election. So far we know that the election is going ahead according to Aung San Suu Kyi, the de facto leader of Myanmar. This is despite a quite virulent wave of COVID-19. Um, it's called a second wave, but in fact, I think Myanmar virtually missed the first wave. And today we're seeing uh, in new cases mounting by 800 to 1,000 a day. And uh, it's spreading um, very, um, very distinctly throughout the country. So um, I think the main question tonight is, can Myanmar have a credible election whether it's now or whether, in fact, it is postponed until a um, uh, later date. And to talk about it, we have on screen over there is uh, Ko Sai Yecho Swamien, who is the Executive Director of the People's Alliance for Credible Elections, or PACE, who's joining us from Yangon, Mingalaba Ko Sai. Um, next to him on my far right is Vanessa Johansson, who is an independent Myanmar-based analyst specialising in peace and conflict uh, studies there. Next to her is David Matheson, uh, a Yangon-based independent analyst and consultant. And uh, then, last but very not least, is Ajahn um, Narumon Tabjumpon, assistant professor and director of the Asian Research Centre for Migration at Chulalongkorn University. She's a specialist in political economic transition in Greater Mekong subregion and tells me that she's been doing a lot of work lately on Myanmar migrant workers. So um, I think that's a really excellent balanced panel to give us their view. And I'd like to start with you, Kosai, sitting in Yangon, what the view is from there. And um, perhaps we might, we do have a map showing the uh, constituencies, the electoral boundaries in Myanmar. So we might swap it, swap you out for that just to show people in a minute. But carry on. Over to you. Can Myanmar have a credible election? <laughs> thanks, Gwen. Thanks. thanks for having me. Um, that's a tricky question, I mean. Uh, first of all, I mean, like, uh, we have to uh, acknowledge that this is the it is the, another important uh, milestone elections in Myanmar since 2010. I mean, I, I and the second elections were held by the uh, the the first opposition part, the first I mean democratic governments in, in, in Myanmar. So I mean, it's, it's it's in many way, this is very important for our uh, political uh, transition. But unfortunately, we are in the middle of the COVID-19, as you just mentioned. Uh, we are. We, we don't know whether it's first wave or second wave, but definitely, when the election commission announced that they 
uh, it was very different situation in July 1st, but now we have uh, every every day we have about 10% positive rate. So I mean, like, I the situation the COVID infection situation is pretty high. Stay uh, if we trust that uh, the the Ministry of Health and Sports statistic. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to highlight we have a very different situation when the election commission announced the election day, and and in. 2020 election is has a very different uh, 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 dimension uh, compared to 2015 election. The first dimension I I wanted to highlight is that in 2015, basically uh, the competition is between uh, NLD versus USTB. I mean, even though we have other political party, ethnic base or other Burma party, basically the competitions everybody is just focusing on on NLD versus USTP. But now we have the, you may see that there are more and more ethnic party merging into one political party. And they all, they already started to speaking out that they have to have their own seat, at least in their states and region. So NLD is not competing only USTP, it's also competing any different political party in different states and region. So, Oh, the pre-election period is pretty competitive and then pretty contentious and pretty sensitive uh, in, in, in so many ways. But at the same time, we have this COVID-19 and then we have a travel restriction. So majority of the political party cannot uh, do their uh, campaigning, cannot reach out to their uh, voters or uh, they did back in 2015. So there are a lot of restrictions for them to, for, for the movement, for the political party in, uh, movement around the country. And then we have a di very, diff very uncertain or very kind of like, like very shaky uh, relationship between political parties and U UEC itself. So you may see, you may aware that we have more than uh, 30 political parties didn't sign the code of conduct. Uh, when the Corps Conduct uh, for the Political Party campaign was launched. And then we have more and more political party decided not to broadcast their uh, campaign speeches on the public state media. It shows that uh, there are a lot of dissatisfactions between, uh, uh, on the, the way UEC has been uh, on handling the issue. Or we may even, we may say that we may, uh, I mean, I, we, we may say something like that, like uh, we, we didn't have a, a, the agreement between political parties and, and union election commissions. How are they going to do or proceed uh, in the pre-election period? So that's kind of like a very uh, worrying situation, uh, even though we didn't see any a huge conflict and clashes. But I mean, this is something like that will be a huge impact after the, post, after the election. And secondly... Uh, is uh, the the safety of the voter and the safety of the poll workers. So we have seen that there are a lot of uh, mock uh, elections uh, organized by the Union Election Commission, but but we are still very uh, concerned about uh, because I mean, like when you look at it, the way when we look at it, the polling stations and uh, on the ground, which is very different the way we were you will see on the Facebook and video messaging. Because I mean, like this is the, the ideal situation is not the the reality is not that uh, that and then the way the public and the voter receive the informations regarding the safety of their safety and regarding how they're going to exercise during the on election day, which is still very limited because of the limited voter education exercised by the civil society and then because of the information is releasing uh, is very late. And then because of the uh, information uh, assessed by the media uh, to the Union Election Commission. So even though the, the information is out there, but I, I'm, I'm not sure the accessibility of the of voter accessibility to the information is very limited. So I am concerned about uh, the safety of the voter and the safety of the polling poll worker. Because one thing is that we may have like, let's say we have uh, 40,000 polling stations. So 10, 10 polling stations, 10 and poll worker per po uh, one polling stations may like four four hundred thousand uh, uh, poll worker we will have on election day. So we don't know uh, uh, how election commission is organizing the training for them, and we don't know what is the safety measurements for them. So 
So that will be a huge impact on the election day too. And thirdly, like because of these uncertainty and because of we can't find the consensus in the election uh, pre-election period, that may uh, end up with a lot of complaint after the elections. I mean, uh, we we are concerned about. There will be a lot of complaints about the result. There will be a lot of the questionings about the, the way the election commissions, the way the electoral process is being exercising. So, oh, to summarize, I, I like, I mean, like that. One thing I just wanted to add it up, like, I when we're talking about the voter, the safety of the voter. So in early August, uh, we conducted a opinion nationwide opinion poll. In that poll, we asked the question about the intention to vote. So when we ask the voter to, to rate how likely they are going to vote from one to five, so one is not probably definitely not vote, five is definitely they will vote. So we just only got 45% of the respondents say that they will definitely vote. It was all early August before the second wave hit the country. So now the situation might be very different. So unless we we comes up with a very specific measure to guarantee the, 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 the safety of the public. We are also concerned about the turnout on election day. So, I mean, I mean, like, but, but I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to be positive. I mean, like, because, I mean, this is uh, one of the important uh, political event for our political uh, transition journey. So let's see how the political party will react the process, how the union elections were quickly it take to address this issue before the election, but we have just only uh, threw it away from the election. So let's see how the place is, uh, how it's going on. Thank you. Uh, for that excellent rundown, can I just check though, when you, you referred a few times to the safety, your concerns about the safety of polling station, do you mean in terms of COVID or you mean in terms of security? I wasn't quite clear what you mean about safety. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I'm basically uh, uh, talking about the in, in terms of COVID, but I mean, thank you for uh, raising this issue. In terms of security, we are also concerning about that. So oh, one of the points I also wanted to highlight relating to that issue is like, I, because of the, uh, the limited uh, travel restrictions for the political party, I mean, majority of the political party in the, in the Burma area, a regime, uh, the region, region area, uh, the, the political parties go from offline campaign to the online campaign. But you know that we have a seven township in Rakhine State. There is no internet asset. So I'm not sure how they assess the information about the, uh, the candidate, about the voter education, and about the safety measure on election day. So this is also one of the concerns uh, uh, we've been raising to, 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 the, to the media and the, the UEC. Oh, okay. Thanks for that clarification. I think we'll turn to Vanessa now um, because you, you're going to also look at uh, the situation in ethnic areas, but maybe also, uh, as mentioned in, in the blurb as well, that uh, we've got uh, some displaced people and also some possible suspensions of voting in some areas. I think Kosai mentioned uh, uh, Rakhine, um, but uh, perhaps you could enlighten us. Exactly. Is this? Yep. Yeah, just okay. speak in close to the mic. Sure. Okay, thanks a lot, Gwen. Um, so perhaps just to start off with a response to Gwen's opening question about whether there can possibly be credible elections in Myanmar at the moment. Um, I mean, I think the answer is clearly no for all of the reasons that Kosai um, just mentioned. Um, but on the other hand, I think we also need to support these. Ironically, I think we need to support these elections at the same time um, because they're the only they're the only option we have. Um, and it is part, as Kosai mentioned, it is part of an ongoing process, um, up, down, and side ways process towards democratization in Myanmar so um, but um, I'm going to talk briefly about sort of the big picture issues in the conflict affected parts of the country um, so sort of, I'm going to start with a few positive points um, because the rest of my presentation and I think what others have to say is also going to be overwhelmingly negative unfortunately um, and then I'll talk about a bit of the details of um, specific issues around the elections and the mechanics of the elections in conflict affected areas and then um, <laughs> risk um, talking about a few scenarios for peace um, negotiations after the elections. What? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Um, so, 
As I said, um, mentioning a few points of, um, highlighting a few points of progress in Myanmar around peace and elections. Um, my first point is that the, the, in exactly five years ago today, a so-called nationwide ceasefire agreement was signed in Myanmar um, by some of the, a, a handful of the ethnic armed organizations in the government. Um, and that process has languished under the current government, but it is in, um, I would say it's on life support now, or in fact one of the ethnic leaders um, referred to it as being on life support, but it's not completely dead. And, so, and there was a commitment made in August in Napidor by, um, at, at a union peace conference to continue peace negotiations and political discussions after the elections. So, um, so yeah, uh, 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 um, sorry, and there's also been an, an iterative um, process of recommitting to uh, uh, what, they, uh, what Aung San Suu Kyi referred to today in her speech to commemorate the signing of the nationwide ceasefire agreement as democratic federal union as the future of the country. Um, you know, very little has been done to realise that. Um, in fact, many things have been done to, um, <laughs> to regress on that, but there has been an over and over a commitment from the NLD and from the military to a federal democratic union in the country, which I think is not nothing. It's not much, but it's not nothing either. Um, second point, um, you know, we're having a, uh, the second um, sort of semi-democratic multi-party election in which it's quite possible and quite, in fact quite likely for a non-military party to win. I think it's important to remember that and that the, the election results will be honoured. It's very unlikely the election results will not be honoured by most, most, if not all, of the key stakeholders. Um, we, as Kosai mentioned, we have consolidated ethnic parties. So in five of the states, um, the uh, ethnic parties managed to merge. Um, and so there'll be less fragmentation of the ethnic vote and possibly greater ethnic representation coming out of these elections. Um, we have a change in the re elections regulations that allow that um, that require most of the military to vote outside the barracks, which is the, it's the first time that has happened. Um, so there's a little bit more transparency around military voting, although there are some other issues with military sharing polling stations with civilians also. Um, as you can imagine, um, there are there are significant COVID measures have been planned for these elections. Um, social distancing and, 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 um, and PPE for the um, personal protective equipment for the polling station staff and voters um, and so on. So um, additional polling stations have been added in order to reduce crowding at polling stations. Um, and then just to say, you know, while the, while the election campaign has really been, um, you know, completely um, damaged or, or, or almost, you know, cancelled in a lot of places due to COVID, um, uh, a lot of parties have shifted online. And I think that's positive, not just for the moment, but also for the long term. Um, I think something like 72 out of the 92 registered parties are active on Facebook. So I think this is a good thing. So those are my positive points. Here comes the rest. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, um, so the big picture issues, of course, the never ending wars in the country, um, military's ongoing power, not just the 25% of um, parliamentary seats that it has under the constitution, but its, um, its sole responsibility and authority to prosecute wars and conflicts. Um, and, and its responsibility for internal and external security in the country has not changed at all, and, and conflict continues. Um, there's dramatic uh, underrepresentation presently of, of ethnic minorities. That around a third, a third to 40% of the population of Myanmar is non-Bama ethnic groups, um, and yet um, only about 8% of um, of seats in the union parliament are uh, held by ethnic parties. Um, and that's probably going to continue um, after this election due to um, my next point, which is that we have a first-past-the-post um, electoral system which favours, uh, tends to favour the NLD um, in Myanmar. Um, and it, it, it generally tends to favour larger parties um, and, and not favour smaller parties. Not always, but, but, but generally tends to. The constitution is, of course, um, basically unchanged. Um, already mentioned about the military's role. Um, the, the nationwide ceasefire agreement, um, first of all, is not nationwide, as I mentioned before, and has also been largely unimplemented over the last five years. 
Um, there's really limited interest in the elections, from, um, particularly from the ethnic population. So Kosai mentioned the excellent survey that um, his organisation PACE did a couple of months ago, um, and it shows, it, it, um, even this is even before the COVID second wave, so in a relatively COVID-free moment in Myanmar, when they asked the question, um, do, you in, do you definitely intend to vote? And only 39% of people in ethnic areas said they definitely intended to 35%, sorry, um, intended to vote where in, um, in, this is in the state, so not 100% not ethnic, but as a proxy for, for ethnicity, for ethnic minorities, whereas in the Bama heartland, 49% of people said they would vote. So it's quite a huge difference, actually, in intention to vote between um, Bama dominated areas and ethnic areas. There's a real apathy um, towards these elections in ethnic areas, in other words. Um, and then, of course, COVID, which um, has been mentioned extensively already. Um, so to, to get to bit, a bit to down more to, um, to the details of what's going on in some of the ethnic areas, obviously, uh, well not obviously, but uh, unfortunately, um, disenfranchisement of um, all kinds of different groups of people. So um, Rohingya, of course, being the largest um, group both inside and outside the country, um, but also people for various reasons without the necessary ID to be on voter lists. Um, many overseas, millions of overseas workers who are not on, on voter lists. Um, at this present point, um, internally displaced people have, do not have facilities to vote, um, despite a commitment to, to making that happen. It may change in the next couple of weeks, let's see. Um, and people in um, ethnic armed uh, organisation controlled areas. So. Um, there are likely to be, well, it's very likely there'll be cancellations in, um, in many parts of the country. And those cancellations happened in 2015. I think my first slide actually included a, a map um, of, of where those cancellations happened in 2015. And that map will probably look fairly similar, except for Rakhine, where um, last time there were not cancellations, and this time there'll be most likely be extensive cancellations of elections. Um, so um, women are still very much underrepresented. Um, only 16% of candidates up from, I think, 13% in 2015. Um, and that's just one indicator of the way in which um, uh, women are not uh, very much engaged in this election um, and also face additional gender-based hate speech, particularly online. Um, of course, the COVID effect again. Um, the, um, we've seen quite a lot of military movements in the last month or two into conflict-affected parts of the country um, in the name of election security, um, but, um, but that in fact you know, tends to have the opposite effect, unfortunately, and it also makes people concerned that in seats in constituencies with very small numbers of voters that um, military voting there could actually change the election's outcome. Um, so um, there's also quite a lot of concern in ethnic areas about domestic migrant movements from the Bama heartland into ethnic areas and that changing the demographics and diluting the ethnic vote in those areas. Um, and then we've also seen quite a fair bit more electoral violence this time compared to 2015. I wouldn't say it was massive like we see in some uh, in other other places, uh, fortunately, but um, but there has been uh, there have been kidnappings. There's been a lot of uh, um, election signboards destroyed. Um, there've been uh, some so there were some some uh, riots as well in um, in the centre of the country. So also a concern. Last slide. <laughs> um, so as I said, I'm going out on a bit of a limb here because who knows what's going to happen exactly in Myanmar <laughs> um, on the 8th of November and beyond. But, um, but I put three scenarios in here. So NLD has a big win, as it did in 2015. The second one is NLD has a modest win. Um, and then the third one is NLD loses, um, probably to the USDP and military-backed um, candidates. So... Um, so, and, and what are the implications of this for um, for a peace process beyond um, 2020? I think the um, you know the big win would be the status quo, basically, with a fairly superficial pursuit of um, of, of peace, um, and really no incentive to to change that approach. Um, the second one, I think, if NLD um, wins a bit less than last in the last elections, uh, maybe ethnic parties will fare better. 
um, then maybe there'll be a bit more, a little bit more pressure on the NLD to move forward. But then um, the mili military is, you know, um, a key, obviously a key, the key player um, in this process, and that it wouldn't change incentives for them. Um, NLD losing, very unlikely. Um, if there was a USDP or military government, would they continue to pursue peace? I mean, they did start this round of peace talks back in, in 2011, um, but, the, but much has changed since then. So um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very big question as to whether that would be something that they would continue to pursue. Thank you. Oh, well, well. <laughs> Thanks very much, that, uh, that was excellent. Uh, I guess um, you might have an idea of the odds on each of those three scenarios. Where's your money? On one, two, two. or three? Number two. Modest win. Yeah, I think that's what uh, seems to be emerging, uh, that situation. Um, so thanks very much for that, Vanessa. And Kuntam, we might just uh, switch back to Kosai if he's uh, still there. Um, and hi. Hi. <laughs> just getting you back on screen. And uh, next, we will turn to Dr. Nagamon of uh, Jula University. And uh, you've been looking very close up at Myanmar and have a, a range of interesting slides. So we're about to swap you out again, Kosai. But don't go away. We'll be back. And you can hear everything, right? Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, I can. Yeah, good. Um, and uh, just to, you do have some slides, right? Uh, Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you. Over to you. Yes, I will have some slide. I think uh, we'll. Yes. Okay. I follow. Thank you, Vanessa, who do the kick off. So I show you with the map of 2015. And many people already asking the question because what the NLD do from 2015 until 2020. The way that NLD work is, I use the word liberalized authoritarianism. So liberalization in terms of economy, but authoritarianism in terms of politics. So I mean, if since I'm from the faculty political side, the basic question that will it create a stable equilibrium or not, or what kind of the price that the people have to pay in case of the situation in uh, Myanmar. So this is the between 2010 and 2015, and then we go back again in 2020. I talked to my uh, Burma friend and ethnic friend. The first question is said that, oh, you cannot compare this way. Because in 2010, uh, NLD did not run for the election. But I said that my comparison is not between NLD, but how the people are thinking. And I think the thing that is also interesting that to follow Vanessa, the Burma heartland is the one who dominate the number of the electorals. And you will see that uh, in 2015 and even in 2010, so the decisive factor for the seat in the parliament, both upper house and lower house, is the Burma heartland. And sadly, the whole Rohingya issue doesn't make the Burma change their mind. So that's the sad story. But what the NLD do for five years from now? So basically, uh, from 2000, actually this is the foreign direct investment. I was asked by Gwen to talking about investment or a bit on the economy. So basically, this is the top 10 uh, investment, and you will see that the highest number is the Singapore. Uh, the second is China with our Hong Kong, but since China already occupy, I mean, include Hong Kong, so China is the big player. So basically, if we look at the foreign direct investment in Myanmar, so basically we see China invest, and this is the number that we see from uh, 1989 until 2019 and in fact this is also very interesting because what kind of investment that do in Burma, Myanmar and how it affect the ethnic state and also affect the election. So basically if we see that kind of foreign direct investment, this is what we see. So basically we see the reopening with the BMI, the Bell, uh, and basically the Burmese 
and China investment, and I think this is also considering that we look at the economic issue. Even though we tend to see economic do not reflect in election, but in fact it is. Because as the incumbent government is do a lot of infrastructure, and for the people, especially in the dry zone, they see that they have some kind of the infrastructure that has been creating. So basically what we see is a kind of, what you call, reproducing more inequality between ethnic state and Burma state. So basically if we see from this map, this is a Chinese investment on the left side, the big one is the Zhao Pui oil and gas pipeline that go from Rakhine state to China. The right one is the Lui Li, which is in the Kachin state. And the word special report is the casino in current state. So basically, we see a kind of infrastructure and also the situation of the investment may not create more democratization, but basically it economic liberalization that coming. So basically what happened? Before 2017, uh, uh, right after 2015 of the election, uh, NLD by Do Aung San Suu Kyi announced that they will keep the oil and gas for the future generation. However, due to the economic situation from 2017, the Zhao Pui is full operation, especially from the oil pipeline. And that go from Zhao Pui to Mandalay, yes, and then go to Kunming, Nanning, and Chongqing. So basically, this is we see the situation of the full scheme economic situation. And at the moment, in case of the foreign direct investment in Myanmar, is very high volume. And that also affects the situation that how the people see. Because before 2017, many people are saying that to compare between Teng Seng government and NLD government, the NLD seem to be create economic prosperity less than the authoritarian government, but since the NLD become the hybrid government in some way, that we see a lot of more in terms of the investment. And one effect uh, or one factor is might be the Rohingya, because the Chinese diplomat already suggest during the UN summit on the Rohingya issue that we should do constructive engagement. So the word constructive engagement come with the gas pipeline. Another issue that we also found out in case of the situation in the ethnic state is that we see a lot of the Chinese uh, investment along the border, with especially the cross-border project that also happened in the Kachin state. But however, those uh, foreign direct investment will go directly to Nepidaw. It doesn't go to the ethnic state, so basically the ethnic doesn't get the revenue, and I think this is one of the issues during the political dialogue on the peace process that who will receive the revenue, even though you have a lot of investment in the ethnic area. And another one, this is the new Sihanu view, basically, that's happened in current state, whether it's good or bad, but this is a situation. And it's a kind of the sad story for those who work on the refugee issue along the Thai Myanmar border that we didn't see a kind of what you call substantive uh, infrastructure development that will help the people for more equality or get their benefit. But you see a lot of the issue of the gambling and that is not sustainable. So this is the last point. How election? What happened, how the 2020 election happened to Myanmar democratic transition? Basically, we see the word legitimation. NLD may claim for their legitimation that finally it creates economic prosperity. But on the other way, we see co-optation. And I think this is the process that happened right now, the co-optation between the government the big business investment outside and also I'm not quite sure whether a certain leader of the elite from the ethnic state. And lastly, we see repression for those who are resistant. And what we can do, I just keep it at the end that maybe the question will come with maybe civil society, I don't know, a few civil society in Myanmar maybe come out like 
COSI and also other organization, whether the ethnic people will start to form a political party and also to resist or at least target against the incumbent government. Unfortunately, I didn't hear. What I see lately is that 34 political parties plus USDP go to general mean online to create a alliance or unite, united alliance, but that may not a democratic way to do that. So basically what we see, back to the issue, the process of cooptation, repression, and a kind of fake legitimation for the election. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was uh, an excellent rundown. Um, very interesting. In fact, we'll um, come back to some of those points and possibly later on maybe Picking up on Vanessa's various scenarios, maybe you could also um, talk about uh, yes. what the likely implications or impact is on Thailand, but we can come back to that after David uh, is going to give us his kind of overview. Having heard all these different points of view, Dave, hopefully you can draw it all neatly together and give us your view, economic, political, strategic. There's Kosai again. So. Over to you. Thank you. I, I don't think I do a very good job of doing it neatly um, <laughs> because it's rather messy um, and, as it is. Um, hello, Kosai. It's really good to see you. Um, uh, look, I, I think three really excellent um, uh, presentations there and touched on a lot of the things that, that, that I was going to say. But I'm just going to try and say um, a few things about the domestic, political, economic and the strategic international dimensions of this. Um, lots of Myanmar colleagues of mine, um, far more astute and, and, um, uh, and, and, and thinking about this, have said that there's two things to, to consider with this very important election, and that is the electoral outcome itself and then the political outcome. So we'll know the results and we can, we can do that. And as, as Vanessa said with the three scenarios, um, you know, an NLD victory is, is almost assured. It's just about the scale of it. Um, and then about how the ethnic... Um, uh, parties do. Um, but we'll know a little bit more in the coming weeks about the extent of cancella cancellations in different parts of the country. And that will have a lot to do with the way um, the elections are perceived in a political fashion after the elections. And this will drag on until at least the end of March when the new parliament forms, the president and the vice presidents are, um, are, are selected. Um, and and a, a lot of these very important things that have been raised um, about the peace process and other, other things. Um, uh, probably won't resume realistically until May of next year. And then we will have COVID still hanging over everything in, 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 in all likelihood. Look, we have to remember back to five years ago um, to just how big the expectations around um, the 2015 elections were um, and how big the expectations of the international community were. And I think any assessment looking backwards over the past five years, the NLD government has been a huge disappointment internationally. Um, been a disappointment to a lot of people inside Myanmar as well, but for the majority of people in Myanmar, in the heartland, as, as you were showing, um, Achan, um, th they can say that their, their lives have marginally improved. Um, there's been stability, there is no war, there's still a lot of poverty, there's still a lot of um, uh, climate-related disasters and flooding and, and, and many other things. Um, there's still massive issues of, of, of land grabs, and these won't go away. A lot of people have to contend with them. But if you look at other parts of the country, things have actually sharply deteriorated. Five years ago, no one was talking about the Arakan army. Now there are 226,000 internally displaced people in Rakhine who are ethnic Rakhine, um, joining 130,000 Rohingya. Um, there's more and more fighting in, in Northern Shan State, part of an unresolved instability that I think the peace process um, looks even more, um, shall we say, uh, ill-performing um, uh, I would say ludicrous in, in, in many respects, um, when, when you compare it with just how many armed groups there are um, in, in the country. And this is coming from the fact that they don't see that there is any political um, gains from contesting elections or actually being part of the formal uh, peace process or the political process. Um, and, and that's really quite unfortunate. We have to remember that, that the NLD government came in as this avowed government of national reconciliation. 
Um, unfortunately, you have to conclude that, that uh, the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi were, were really quite disastrous at that, and that she saw national reconciliation as reconciliation between her and the military. And it was between Bama Buddhist political elites, not between normal people, and certainly not between um, uh, ethnic communities and more marginalised communities um, in the country. And she's also failed at that. I think that there's been no improvement in, in, in civil military relations um, at all. Um, another uh, big uh, shortcoming of, of the government, I think, has been the lack of, of constitutional reform. A lot of the core promises from 2015 have just not materialised. Um, people's lives may have grown a little bit better in, in, in many places, um, but they haven't improved in, 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 in many other places. Uh, quickly on the elections, because I think Achan did a fantastic job of, of pointing that out, but I, I would add one more thing. I think that there's Myanmar's economic future is facing... Um, uh, basically being stuck between a hammer and an anvil of, of Chinese investment and I think increasingly, um, and COVID I think will accelerate this, um, a lack of Western investment um, uh, done well. I think Myanmar increasingly, um, the government is, is turning more to this World Bank style development, UNDP, um, very liberal models of, of, of development in which uh, you know, communities are basically marginalised. And um, it, it, it always surprises me, you know, having followed Myanmar for more than 25 years, um, how Aung San Suu Kyi used to decry the very, um, you know, uh, infrastructure-heavy development that the military was really into. And she's become that person herself. She likes big projects. She likes big amounts of money going into, into, into government bureaucracies. And um, she preaches to people that they must be hardworking, loyal, um, and... Uh, um, and, and show responsibility for themselves. And this is really coming through in a lot of the speeches she's giving around the, 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 uh, the COVID surge um, and, and this hectoring tone that she has about, you know, you must be responsible citizens. You have responsibilities. Um, you know, you don't have rights. You have responsibilities. Um, and I think increasingly there, there's going to be a turn um, towards this um, uh, with the economy. One thing, I, th I think you mentioned one piece of the puzzle with casino capitalism, which is a, a, a very big thing in, in Myanmar and has been for, for more than 30 years. Um, just to show how dysfunctional parts of the country are, um, in Northern Chan State, one of the biggest drug economies in the world is, is cranking out more than $40 billion worth of crystal methamphetamines, um, plus the heroin trade, plus... You know, the country is awash in cheap yaba and, and, and lots of other drugs. And the government really hasn't addressed uh, the drug problem in, in any meaningful way or, or see how it actually impacts on the economy and, and, and on society. Um, so I think the economic challenges um, for this are going to be really quite great. And if she can't fix the, the political elements of this and create more coalitions between multiple people in the country, then, then I think looking at economic reform is, is going to be far more difficult. And, you know, China really does smell an opportunity here to use COVID cover as, as, as coming in and grabbing what it can um, and will likely fuel armed conflict in, in, in a large part of the country. Uh, finally, looking at the more strategic um, elements of this, in, in the past five years of, of, of the NLD government, um, and this can only um, exacerbate, I think, Myanmar has become more of a, of a frontline state in a new Cold War uh, between China, the West, and Japan, and competition for resources, competition for, um, for loyalty and, and, and access to markets, I think, will, will only increase in the near future. And in, India is in there somewhere in the mix as a, as, as a junior partner trying to get involved in this as well. But I think one thing that has happened, especially since 2016, 2017, um, is that the domestic narrative of what's happening in the country um, is increasingly um, ricocheting off the international perceptions of what's going in the country. Um, quite rightly, internationally, people are um, deeply concerned, um, shocked, horrified um, about what has happened to the Rohingya, um, quite rightly. Domestically, it's just not that big an issue. In fact, it's kind of playing into Aung San Suu Kyi's um, legitimacy um, amongst a lot of people. that She went to the International Court of Justice last uh, year and actually defended the country. And most people thought she, she did a pretty good job. Um, a lot of the very important international accountability mechanisms, the International Criminal Court, the ICJ, and the Independent International uh, Mechanism on Myanmar, will not go away. Um, they're collecting evidence right now. 
And any idea amongst the military or the, the civilian political system that these will go away um, j just won't happen. So unfortunately, you're going to see a country that's looking further and further away from the West and more to regional countries um, uh, and, and diversifying its, 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 its foreign policy, um, looking increasingly towards China, grudgingly, um, uh, increasing its, its, its romance with Russia um, and as, as a source of, of... I mean, all, all of the weapon systems that you see um, being used almost every day in Rakhine State now, jets, helicopters multiple launch rocket systems, thermobaric weapons, um, either come from Russia or North Korea. Um, so that's where it's choosing. And that, that's another thing, if you want to kind of look backwards, the, the optimism in the West for, for military engagement in Myanmar several years ago was wildly optimistic and has gone absolutely nowhere. Um, but I do want to conclude on um, first a, a rather bitter note and, and then a very hopeful note. Um, one is that, that I do think parts of this election will be credible. I think COVID will make it um, far worse. Um, but there are, um, are more than enough elements of it um, to really question the legitimacy of, of the elections. Um, that said, um, I think Myanmar must look around the world and think, well, you know, democracy writ large is looking rather shabby. Um, and, you know, who, who are you to actually, you know, lecture us? Um, and, and so I think we've got to keep that, that in mind as well. Um, but that said, I think the hope for the country um, really is um, a lot of people in civil society um, and within institutions that actually do believe that democracy is the right path for the country and do want to make things cleaner. And, and you see all these people, whether it's in the media, whether it's great groups like, like COSIS and, and many others, who do want to make the government and the military accountable and see that democracy is, is, is the best way to do that. And I think internationally, if you want to actually see a rights-respecting Myanmar, in which there is a place for the Rohingya and lots of other minorities, um, you'll see that that is the best way um, forward as well. And, and I think criticising these elections is, is very important, but done in a way that actually does understand um, the context and the difficulties that they're facing. Um, and, and by all means, criticise the State Councillor, because her, her, her role in this, I think, is, has been quite appalling. Um, uh, for a, a, a democratically elected leader to be actually running an electoral process, which she's doing um, during this COVID crisis, is, 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 is really quite absurd. Um, so I'd like to end there and, and, um, and, and uh, hand it back to Gwen. Well, thanks very much, Dave. Excellent. Um, you really um, encapsulated a lot of issues there. Uh, actually, just to throw in before we turn to some more discussion and uh, questions from the floor or over Facebook, if, um, if uh, perhaps uh, one of my colleagues could help me monitoring those Facebook questions. Um, but you mentioned, I, I love that line about... Um, Myanmar as the frontline state in a new kind of Cold War with Japan, China, a bit of India. Uh, I don't think you mentioned the US, which has been conspicuously absent in its interest in the last um, few years. But we do have a, a little election coming up uh, just before the Myanmar election. Um, and I'm not saying that either candidate would really uh, give a toss about uh, their Myanmar policy, and I don't think it came up in any of the presidential or vice presidential debates, but, um, you know, I, I dare surely... say Donald wouldn't be able to find Myanmar on a map. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I wouldn't like to ask, actually, but... No, um, no, just don't mention it to him. Yeah, well, don't mention that or the war, but um, maybe... Uh, I don't know if there's any prospect. I mean, back in... I covered also the 2015 elections, and as you say, there was huge Western hopes, but particularly the US, as we know, Obama and um, put a lot of eggs in the Suu Kyi basket, Hillary Clinton. Everyone was in love with Myanmar back then. And um, there's barely been a peep. Uh, so would you include the US as a player in your overall strategic view of the international sort of aspects? I, I, I would actually, partly because I think China is so sensitive about them being there. Um, you know, if, if you go to uh, Michener in, in Kachin State, lots of Kachin people I speak to are like, look, you know, we need the, China, the, we need, um, the Americans and the British to stay and to stay engaged because they're, they're the only ones that, that, can, that can push back. Um, every time one of the British or, or UK ambassadors goes to Michener, 
Um, according to, to senior leaders there, they say, we, we get this phone call from a Chinese official straight afterwards berating us. You know, how could you let them come here? Why did you speak to them? So there's a lot of sensitivities. And Japan's the same. The Japanese ambassador didn't go to, um, to Michina um, for, for more than a decade because he didn't want to offend China. Now it's all, all bets are off. Um, and so I, I don't think Myanmar looms large in the United States unless you're talking about the Rohingya and the great disappointment that is Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, but I think America still looms fairly large um, within the Myanmar um, imagination, but mostly as a disappointed friend. You know, you, you used to be part of us. You know, where did Washington and London go? And so there is a sense of, like, you know, fair-weather friends who didn't stick with us in the hard times. Right. Again, not realising the, the scale of the horror over the, what happened to the Rohingya. Right. Thank you. Well put. Um, i just uh, also like to come back to Kosai on your uh, citing those very interesting polling figures, and that was pre-COVID, that only, what was it in the ethnic areas, only 30... 35%. 35% of eth voters in ethnic areas intend to vote, and only, was it 49%? I remember in uh, the uh, states, right, oh, the regions, um, meaning the Bama-dominated uh, areas. I remember five years ago, I mean, there was... I, what was the turn? It was incredible uh, five years ago. There was so much enthusiasm. Are you suggesting that there's um, disillusionment generally with the whole process of elections? Does that mean there is a loss of faith in uh, the democratic process, basically? I mean, like... Uh you know, the elections are uh, is just a as a mechanism to, to elect the official. I mean, it's not the election may not necessarily solve the whole issue. I mean, like, there are a lot of issue which is beyond the electoral process. But something is that. But I mean, election result should reflect their political aspiration, their their hope. I mean, like if our electoral process, I mean, cannot represent what they are expecting or what they what they are aspiration i think they will start losing uh, hope in these electoral process i mean like you may start you may just you may see that on on facebook there are no vote campaign just started i mean like this is kind of i mean like it's in, i mean, I mean like, it's kind of like a worry indicator about people started losing hope in this uh, democratic mechanism i mean and then i mean like when you look at it, the rakhine uh, we have a Rakhine majority in the parliament, in the Rakhine by parliament, but they, they didn't have a, had, had the right to choose their th chief, uh, the, the, the chief minister. So, I mean, like, we have to, I mean, like, elections event, it's just kind of like, like a, a, a starting point to make, I mean, like, to, to go the process. But, I mean, we also have to who look at it, our electoral system, we also look at have our electoral boundary. Otherwise, I mean, like, like people might be start losing uh, the hope. Oh, but I mean, like, sadly, I mean, these elections should be higher turnout because uh, in the in the states, uh, as we, I just mentioned earlier, there are more ethnic party merging into one. So it, it could be a driving force for that for their ethnic people to mobilize them to go out and vote. But unfortunately, we have this COVID-19 and, and restriction. And unfortunately, we cannot come up with the, the, the alternative mechanisms to give them, to give the platform for the political party to reaching out their community. So that's a kind of like, like disappointment. I don't mean like, this kind of mean like, uh, kind of, uh, I mean like disappointment for, 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 for the people to, to get uh, to know their, their candidate. Right. Well, thank you. And um, I, I'd also like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Naruman, mm -hmm. uh, because we are sitting in Thailand and because, you know, <laughs> it is so fundamental that yeah. Myanmar's just across the border and right now I guess there's a, a, a growing paranoia in Thailand about the COVID situation in Myanmar. So the, the borders really are locking down, though. I, I can barely believe that they're totally closed. Um, but just on, in a normal situation, I mean, how, how much do you think, uh, you know, what do you think are the implications in Thailand for what happens in Myanmar from, from now? I mean, barring the, the whole COVID situation. Uh, 
maybe before we talking about Thailand on the COVID, maybe Kosai can add me. I remember that before March this year, before the they have a internal poll station by the NLD and the result saying that it may not have enough seat to be only one party to form the government. But after the COVID, the extra, the second poll, internal poll of the NLD found out that the NLD will win more. So basically, because in 2015, right, it get around 70%, but this time they're saying that is the COVID factor that they may get more than 70. This is, I'm not sure, it's unconfirmed, but this is the information that I received, but why? I follow Kosai in a sense that because the political party cannot do their political campaign and the incumbent government have more choice to talk about the vaccine, the hospital and also any other mm -hmm. that they can get more people. The second thing linked to what Gwen asked me about the migrant worker and uh, the government also allow advanced vote by allow the, the migrant worker to vote. And I think they cast the vote last week, something like that. And according to my information, the people separate between ethnic issue and national poll. Basically, some of them will vote for NLD for the national parliament and saying that they will vote for ethnic party for the regional parliament. And I don't know in this context, the decentralization from their perspective can help the chain or not, but I, it seemed to me that it's still going on this way and, and in that case. And for Thailand, I think Thailand seemed to be, what you call, happily working with the migrant worker who cannot go home. <laughs> So basically, this is, this is ironic because according to the information, I just talked to Gwen that uh, Thailand will face like 8 million unemployed, but in that context, around 400,000 who are unemployed will be migrant workers, and they are still in Thailand. So what happened right now is that they will find a new employer in Thailand, and are they going to be what you call the voter from which political party? I think for them during the COVID time, sadly, they will look at the economic issue. They will think that the incumbent government may have a chance for them to support. And, and I don't know, and it's also sadly that comparing with 2015 and 2020, in 2015, you have more political campaign from independent, from uh, uh, what you call civil society, and also from many political uh, uh, party, and also from those who are in exile to campaign about changing Myanmar through the election. But it seems to me this time it's not that way. And in that context, it's maybe I will go to your either number two. <laughs> or even number one for the scenario of the election. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. And uh, Vanessa, I just, know you had a point yeah. to make. Oh, just to add briefly, I don't know if you can hear me, yeah. just to add briefly on the migrant workers voting in Thailand. I mean, it's a very tiny percentage of the migrant workers and, refu and refugees who are, who are registered to vote in Thailand. It's about 40,000 yeah. um, compared to several million who are here. I mean, w which could actually sway the vote if they, if they were registered, right? Yeah, um, it's 109,000 yeah. around the world yeah. that, are, that have registered. It's tiny. Yeah. Is voting. it difficult to get registration? I presume everything's <laughs> difficult no. in Myanmar. No. 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 The problem is like, like the current system is only allowed the migrant worker, and I mean that the people who live in outside Myanmar can only vote at the embassy or this, at the council, counseling office, consular office. So I mean like, people might, people who living in Bangkok will be able to go and vote at the embassy and Chiang Mai can go to the consular office. But I mean, the other part of the locations, they might not be. So we just only got in-person vote at the embassy. Right. Yeah. So if we could come up with a kind of like post their vote or other innovative way, that could be like, I mean, like increasing huge, the yeah. number to be the, the voter outside Myanmar. Right. That but as it is, 40,000, yeah, it's so, a minuscule. Actually, incidentally, uh, Dr. Naramon, since you study the subject, um, it would be interesting to know what your take is on how many are actually left in 
Thailand at the moment, uh, Myanmar migrant workers, and how many left to go back? Oh, uh, registered, I suppose. Well, a register. Uh, basically, right now we have 2.8 million migrant worker from Myanmar registered in Thailand. And uh, from during the COVID, uh, I don't know how many going home, but as I say that. The it's Thai, yeah, the 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 Thai, the is around only hundred thousand who go home. So basically, you still have a huge number who are living here and working here, and right. and 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 I don't, and their perspective. I mean, from the political situation, this is also very interesting. But nobody doing the research with them about the I mean issue of democratization. I see. Well, thank you. Um, we might open the floor to questions if uh, there is one. Um, I can see a couple of people maybe. Oh, yes, please identify. Oliver, you can identify yourself. Oh, we've got someone there, but maybe Sorry. next after, after Oliver. Hey, good evening, and thanks for uh, a really interesting discussion. My name is Oliver Slow. I'm here sort of on a freelance basis. I have a couple of questions. I guess first for Vanessa, uh, you mentioned that the NCA was kind of hanging by a thread and you, you offered those scenarios. Uh, I guess my question is a bit, is two-pronged really, is what in, in, this out, in this election, what might be the best outcome for the peace process? And then I guess more broadly, looking at the peace process as a whole, what do you, th obviously there's many, many aspects that need to change, but what are some of the, the most important aspects that need to, need to look at for that to move forward? And the second question I guess is for Dave, but I guess for anyone who wants to answer it, um, as you say, NLD will probably win this election pretty comfortably but the NLD doesn't seem to have much beyond Aung San Suu Kyi herself. She's 74 years old. Not, she, just may, she may make the next election, but she won't have many more, probably. Uh, what is Myanmar's... I know you, don't have, you know you don't have a crystal ball, but the information at hand, what, what does Myanmar's political future look like beyond Aung San Suu Kyi? <laughs> okay. Well, do you want to uh, kick off, uh, Vanessa, on that peace process uh, question? Thank you, Ollie. Um, unfortunately... You know, your question was around the best outcome for the peace process after these elections. I'm not very optimistic about the peace process after these elections. I think um, that the NLD will win one way or another and um, their incentives for progressing um, real political negotiations rather than these sort of superficial <laughs> pageants that they've been having in Napidor. <laughs> Sorry if that's too dismissive, but, um, you know, is, 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 pretty, is pretty slim. Um, you know, as I said before, I mean, I think maybe if there's, um, if there's a better outcome for ethnic parties that may send a, both send a message to the NLD and also have um, some people inside the parliamentary tents that um, that are that are really you know able to, to put some ongoing pressure on for for some real progress um, towards fe the democratic federal union that everyone has ostensibly agreed to right um, but yeah not terribly optimistic um, one I guess slight wild card is that the um, current commander-in-chief is due to retire in mid uh, next year um, and who then goes in to replace him whether that that person is uh, you know more or less inclined to to real negotiations and potential uh, gradual reform of the of the military's role um, it's again it's unlikely but it is an uncertain it is a wild card right um, what needs to change in the peace process? Um, I mean, I think, it, I think it's all about political will and incentives. I mean, there's a lot of kind of technical things you can say about the, 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 the nature of the committees and the formation of the committees and, you know, what the joint monitoring committee looks like and what the political committee looks like and so on. But I think fundamentally it's about, um, you know, the, the willingness to have real conversations and, and, and make real um, changes and, and move towards um, constitutional reform that would be needed to, 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 settle, to settle this once and for all, right? So, um, but yeah, I mean, there's also a lot of technical fixes which I think would help. Um, for example, the Joint Monitoring Committee, which is supposed to monitor a ceasefire and doesn't, um, you know, is, is, is dominated by the military, and it's, so it's not really joint. Um, and it's certainly not neutral and independent. So, so that, that's sort of one technical fix that, that, might, that might be addressed. Well, thanks. And before, um, uh, I'd just like to jump to see if Kosai has any view on this whole question of the best outcome uh, elected from the elections of, for the peace process and vis-a-vis, -vis, I presume, the ethnic voter. Although that's probably a very tricky question. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> I mean, David and Vanessa have a, a good answer, I mean, than me. <laughs> Sorry, would you say, I didn't catch that. Ah, uh, okay. 
Right. Uh, while, while we have you, Kosai, um, I'm not dodging your question, Ollie. I'm not at all. But I'd really like to hear from Kosai what he thinks happens um, with the NLD and the question of succession and, um, and, and looking into the future. Because I think that's really something that a lot of people are asking. <laughs> Uh, I mean, like that was, this question has been asked since I mean, like uh, uh, five years ago. Uh -huh. uh, everybody was asking the same questions for for the, I mean, different the same reason. Uh, I as as a as a Myanmar citizen as a as a Myanmar citizen as a I mean, like living in Myanmar. So we normally I mean, like. Uh, we normally doesn't see that way yet. So, but anyway, I mean, like uh, I'm started to seeing that one thing NLD started to uh, nominating, and then one thing NLD started to uh, bringing the new people in the in the CEC and then other level of the, C the central committee. You you will see that there are a lot of new people, but unfortunately, you. People were thinking about the chief minister of the Mandalay, but I mean, unfortunately, he is sick of like. Uh, so, so I mean, like, but but I I think that NLD has something in in their mind. I just don't know what it's really. But you can look at it the way NLD has been nominating the candidate. You will see there are a lot of youth candidate in this election. So they see this issue. They already started to thinking. They already started the the plan. I think. And your turn now. Uh, yeah. Can oh. I ask Kosai a little bit? Because I feel that the NLD itself is not nationally for democracy, but it's more rather very hierarchy. Those who are in the central committee will be like a generation of 1990 election, something like that. And even those who come from the election will not uh, very difficult to be in the seat in the central committee and on a certain period, but will they change their mind, at least look at, I mean, sadly for Thailand, but at least we see some new generation. But how is the NLD situation like for Minteng? I mean, even the one they said that is a new generation is nearly 60, right, for Minteng and other. So how the NLD will change something? <laughs> Sorry, I can't <laughs> overquen. <laughs> Just a little question there. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. I mean that's <laughs> this thing is beyond me to be honest. Like. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Could, well, are you, batting, just... are you batting that to David? Okay, David, you've got. Um... <laughs> uh, secession in the NLD. I'd like to answer that by broadening it out a little bit, um, and by questioning uh, some of the bigger parties in the country and how they've been doing with the question of succession. Because, you know, in, if you look at, at, at graphs of, 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 of ages, um, there's a lot of men uh, in their 60s uh, running as candidates. Um, and a lot of political parties are run by this gerontocracy um, of entitlement. And, and the NLD is definitely one of them. It's very rare that there's, there's, there's a woman um, running a, a, a major political party. Um, uh, so there's a question of both gender and of, of, of youth. And as, as Kosai was saying, th this election could have been quite remarkable if it hadn't been for COVID because 5 million new voters were eligible. 5 million people turned to voting age in the past five years. And that's really quite significant. And as they say in, in, in election circles, you've got to get someone young so that they'll keep voting. If they miss the first couple of elections, they just become professionally uh, um, disinterested. Um, the other th question, I think, is, is women's participation. Um, I mean, it's 16% of all of the, the, the several thousand candidates are women. Um, the party that's done the best is the Shan Nationalities League for Democracy, about 30%. Then the Mon Unity Party's done pretty well. One of the, the Ta'ang parties, uh, pretty good. The, the NLD's almost down there with the USDP. Um, and, and so I, I, I think you've got to look at the demographics of all of these political parties. And, and even though the SNLD, I think, is probably done the best out of all parties in appealing to, to youth. Um, they don't have a huge voting base, unfortunately. So they've done all these very progressive things, but you know, whether that means that they're going to um, be decisive in, in the elections. Um, the question of succession, um, I, I don't want to dodge it. Uh, I, I think when Aung San Suu Kyi goes, I think the league breaks up. 
um, you know, I, 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 I really see her as a figure of, um, I mean, she, she's got that autocratic mix of school mom and dictator. Um, and she, and she, she really enjoys her, her, her job as state councillor, um, which she created herself. I mean, that, that, that should, you know, give you some insight into, into her thinking. Um, you know, I don't think she's, you know, I think she wants to be state councillor for life. And if she can really get 59, um, uh, section 59 of the, the constitution change and become president, then, then, then even better. But I do think the NLD is held together by her force of character. Um, and I do wonder what happens then with the league when particular Mandalay issues, Sagai issues, right. Delta issues start coming up. So. I think the, the broader question rather than within the NLD might be uh, about is there any kind of possible not Suchi like figure? I agree there's no one who could match her, um, but are there obvious or people, I suppose, that you think could come in her wake? I mean, I look at Myanmar all the time, and I, ca I guess there's a lot of interest in the businesswoman who left the NLD and set up her own party, Ted Ted Kine, but, mm -hmm. you know, she's certainly no Aung San Suu Kyi in terms of reach or, or oratory skills or anything like that. So but You don't actually want another Aung San Suu Kyi. No. I, I think that's, that's the problem. I think the international media is like the next Aung San Suu Kyi. It's like <laughs> the current one's not actually really doing a great job. Why would you want another one? Yeah, um, that's a fair and, enough and so point, I, but I, I guess I think sort of, well, let's say Generation 88 inspired a lot of hope before, you know, these great faces of that generation mm. and, and have been a disappointment as well in terms of their, you know, leadership of any kind of political organisation. I, I think if, if you started looking at lots of young people, um, one example is Martin Nor, Matthew Lepay, who's running for the SNOD in Musa up in Northern Chanster. This, this guy's a very well-known environmental activist. Um, you want that mixture of people that have got that kind of background and are appealing to grassroots people. A lot of the, the younger female candidates are embedded in their communities and are actually, they, they've come up through the ranks, as it were. Um, and, and you want more professional people getting involved in politics, not just uh, blind party ideologues um, who, who do whatever uh, the senior figure tells them to do. You actually want a whole generation of leaders to emerge in, in, in lots of different areas. So I don't think casting around for the new Aung San Suu Kyi is, 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 is really what's needed. Yeah, I guess that's an unfortunate sort of, you know, comparison. I guess it, it, what was meant was really anyone obvious. Um, and, you know, if your view is actually not entirely negative. It seems there are some... I think there's, there's a lot there of people that should be getting involved in... Some inspiring people out there. And, and a lot of people who, um, um, who I think want to get involved in, in politics but are deterred by the old men and are deterred by the authoritarian yeah. culture within a lot right. of parties. Right. Um, also deterred by, you know, would I run in this election because I'm a woman and expect a whole bucket of nasty social media crap thrown at me? So a lot of women actually didn't, didn't run because of that. And, and so there's a very nasty political culture that you see yeah. online and, um, and, and in person in Myanmar that deters a lot of people, and that's got to change as well. Right. Good point. Thank you. Um, I think uh, there was a question... Wait, Paul, there was one here, and then you... Oh, OK. Um, Paul, you've got a question uh, being asked over Facebook, I believe. I do. A question for the contestants. Can you just stand a bit closer to me? <laughs> For the panelists, sorry. Paul Greening asks, how will the people movement in Thailand affect this election in Myanmar? <laughs> well, can I, can I actually add to that? Because that was going to be one of my questions, which is that there's been a lot of speculation but in the region overall, if you look, not just what's happening in Thailand. There's big riots in Indonesia now, um, specifically about efforts at labour re labor reform, but obviously building on long frustration over lockdown and the harsh impact on a lot of people, particularly the poor. Malaysia's in political turmoil. You know, Cambodia, there's, you know, human rights groups are, are complaining about, you know, increasingly about repression. And the Philippines, of course, complaints about how COVID is being used as a cover to, you know, undermine human rights. So overall, you've got a region in ferment which is partly driven by the COVID factor. 
So, yes, yeah, so I think it's a very good question about what's the likelihood. And, Koso, you might also have a view, but um, to you, Arjun, first. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, uh, let's do these th two things. The Thai elites follow the Myanmar way. So, basically, that you see the cell coup after cell coup and form normal state of emergency to be state of serious emergency, right? This is what we heard, literally, see? So, this is, well, this is a literally translating from the Thai word, right? We already have one emergency decree, and now you have serious emergency, yeah. right? No, no, this severe, is, severe, severe. Well, it's a severe emergency. Well, yeah, really severe. Uh, the COVID itself creates the issue of life, but this one is, I don't know, anyway. So, but this is what the Thai elite learned from the military and from the hybrid system in Myanmar, but what the uh, civil society of the political movement, I mean, effect, in, look at the election in Myanmar, I think at least the Thai political movement look at Myanmar and saying that, oh, look at Myanmar. For them, they have election, even though it's my call competitive authoritarianism, but at least it's competitive. But for us, we have full authoritarianism without any competitiveness at all. And the second thing, I think this is also related to maybe, because I can add me more, I think the situation on the education in Myanmar, I think in Myanmar, the situation for the young generation, I mean, uh, in 2015, those who work for NLD are the labor. If you're going to Leng Chaya and also going to any industrial zone, they are the worker, not the employer, and also younger generation and the artists. But during the COVID, I think the situation right now, I think they start with the problem, asking the question in terms of the lockdown. But the difference, uh, the way that Myanmar handled the COVID, comparing with Thailand uh, right now, uh, good or bad, the Aung San Suu Kyi insisting that the factory is still open. So in that way, it's a kind of the new challenge that you keep the worker saying that you still have job, but you are not able to go out for the political or any other campaign. So in that case, maybe in 2020, we will see the result of the election that whether the labor or the movement in Myanmar, how do they vote for the, for the uh, situation on the election. The second thing, the issue of the people movement in Thailand, the one that link with the situation of the election in Myanmar, is more on the environment. The issue that link to the transnational issue, such as the issue of migration, the issue of transborder trade, or the issue of transborder environment, and that the one that they are linking with the movement in Myanmar, and they aim for changing, uh, but not the national election. What I heard is more on the regional parliament. They are asking for more power from the ethnic government or asking for revenue sharing rather than put everything to Nebido. The one that I see from the people movement in Myanmar that link with the Thai movement is that Right now, it's more on the concentration of power. It's not decentralization yet. And I think that might be a new campaign. But I don't know whether it's, how much it affects the national election. That maybe remain to be seen. Thank you. Kosai, do you have a, a view on all this? And, and what is being said in Myanmar on social media or anything about the... Is anyone interested what's happening in Thailand? <laughs> oh, they are? Yeah, I mean, I... There are a lot of friends on Facebook. They, they change their uh, Facebook cover photo uh, using the Thai uh, movement, like three fingers thing. So I mean, I I, I, I always think a lot of people uh, changing their cover photo. But you know, uh, social movement protests and demonstrations are are one of the key activities we've been engaging. I mean, since since the military rule, since the authoritarian regime. And then, I mean, even after 2015, you will see that there are a lot of protests and demonstrations, even in Yangon, I mean, like. But you know that uh, the, the government has been cutting down 
I mean, harshly, the government has been charged a lot of the activists, uh, uh, I mean, like, sending to jail for several years. I mean, like, one of our, one of our friends, he just got uh, charged for uh, six months because, I mean, because of the, the movement he involved, like, uh, 2014, I mean, like, before. So he, he just got, like, a six months in jail. And why his wife just uh, gave him birth uh, a second child last month, I mean, like. So, I mean, it's been, it, it, it's, it's been our, I mean, like, I want the, the, the activity we, we always inclined to. But unfortunately, we, there are less, uh, less and less, I mean, like, we have seen that there are very, there are a, a, a kind of progressive youth who be engaging environmental issues, who are engaging peace process, who are engaging more other right, like, like the LGBTQI rights, kind of more progressive view in, in, in our society. But at the same time, there are people who are just stayed, are trying to don't roll the boat because we are just in transition. So we need to be uh, patient. Uh, the government just started in just one or three years ago. So there are kind of these kind of uh, I mean like, like, like conflicting ideas among our uh, society. So there are a lot of pushback from the society, so those kind of protests and movement in the, especially in the region. So you will see that there are more and more protests in the states. You will see that, uh, like, like protests for the Austin statue in Kaya State. So because of this movement, when you look at uh, the election landscape in 2020, you will see a lot of uh, civil society member uh, cross over to the political party. You will see that a lot of candidates are from the civil society and from the activists. So I think that I don't know what is the current uh, uh, bank, the, the demonstration in Thailand will impact the 2020, but I mean, it's, it's always like inspiration. So when we're talking among ourselves, we, we inspire the demonstration in Malaysia, we inspire the demonstration in, in different else. We even in, in inspire the demonstration and social movement in the Belarus, I mean, like something. So, so I mean, like it's, it's been in, in, in our, in our uh, I mean, political uh, activism. Well, that's, uh, that's some food for thought. Um, Phil, I think you have yeah. a question. Hi, how are you? Phil Robertson from Human Rights Watch. Uh, I actually wanted to ask a question about the Union Election Commission. Um, I mean, obviously, we have seen that they have uh, censored a number of statements by various different political parties, including um, DPNS and several others, who have then declined ultimately to take up the free uh, public TV uh, and radio uh, uh, opportunity for them. Um, I'm wondering to what extent um, is the UEC even remotely impartial in going <laughs> through this process? I mean, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, we've seen when we look at various elections, whether it be in Cambodia or Malaysia or here in Thailand, that one of the ways that the ruling elites skew the the, the situation is by political appointments to the election commission who then rule the way they want. And so my question is if we're seeing various different election disputes or issues connected to the Myanmar election, uh, what do you expect from the UEC? What do you expect they're going to do? I think Kosai should definitely <laughs> take the first answer to that. I mean, when we compare the, these two election commissions, the, the, the election commissions back in 2015 and election commissions in 2020. So basically, the legal framework is the same. There is nothing changed in the legal framework, in the electoral legal framework. So the only things we could see is that how they actually implement, how they actually exercise the right, uh, the, the law they, 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 they granted to them. So in the, pre the previous election is trying to, they, they realize that they need to who they know that they've been criticized because of the affiliation with the USGB, people, people don't trust in them. And so they're trying to come up with uh, the mechanisms to build trust within the, uh, the, the election stakeholders, like political parties, uh, civil societies, and media. But for this one, uh, they have a very different perspective on the other, with, with the stakeholder. So they, they try to distance from the political party they try to distance from the civil society. They even try to distance from the, uh, the, 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 the media. So you will see that uh, uh, pace has been in, in the first place. Pace has been denied to get the accreditation. 
So, and then they also changed the, 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 the way they interpret observer in Myanmar. So it's, it's in, in terms of like, in Myanmar, it's kind of the Leila group. In, in English, it seems to be the status group of election. It's not necessarily about the observation. So I have to say that the perception of the do want the, the, the media, political parties, and civil society has been dramatically changed in, 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 this, in this election. So uh, I, I don't want to jump the conclusion that, say, the, how the elections, uh, uh, election commissions will be deciding the electoral dispute, but it is where we a kind of, uh, there will be, there will be it's, it's fair to say that uh, there will be a lot of dissatisfactions uh, with the election commission's uh, decisions uh, on how they were made a, a solve the issue after the election. Oh, oh, don't fight, don't fight. <laughs> Okay. And I think it's important also to comment on the, you know, the composition of the UEC. It has 15 members, all of whom are male, um, and 14 out of the 15 are Bama ethnic. So there's no diversity, and, and all of a certain age, right, so basically. So I think that's, that really impacts on perce both perceptions and probably realities of, um, of the extent to which they, they're, they're, they're as neutral as possible. But, I mean, just listening a little bit to people on the ground, I, I, I do hear varying things about the performance in terms of the UEC sort of facilitating a level playing field for the campaign, for example. In some places that they, there's a real sense of bias and in other places that they've really tried hard to do that. So I think it's a bit of a mixed picture as to how the, um, yeah, the performance of the UEC as a, as a supposedly neutral body on the ground looks. Thanks, Vanessa. Can I, can I just add quickly yeah. to that? I think given the lack of independence, uh, the lack of the fact that the UEC actually mirrors the country, um, in, in which these elections are going to be held. I think it has to be the first priority of a lot of international donors to fix the UEC and to put pressure on, on the new government um, in, in 2021 to reform the UEC from, from the bottom up, um, to actually give more resources to the UEC on the ground um, to do its job actually where people live, um, and at a higher level to actually seek genuine independence. Um, and, and you can only do that by not being... Um, uh, basically the, the the whipping boys of the state councillor and right. she, she's she's setting them up to fail i think during this this um and you, she'll, she'll blame them for um in any deaths that that uh, result from the elections um during this COVID surge yeah but sorry i thought when it was you know went into that 2015 election we all watched as it emulated it got more sophisticated it adopted some of the western techniques it was being advised and funded by all kinds of international bodies, including IFAS has been all over it. I mean, you know, how much more help can they possibly... Well, they, they, they ignored a lot of the, the international assistance over the past few years. Right. I mean, that, that, that's the irony. I mean, Suu well, Kyi set them up not to be strong and independent and, and, and to actually reach for international standards. Um, she, she set them up to be weak um, so, so that she could basically take charge. And, and I think that's going to be one of the major factors looking back on this. Um, the questions, the integrity of the elections, is, is the performance of the UEC, which has been dreadful. Very good point. Thank you. Question, please Hi. identify Hi, yourself. Hi, Nati, just me and my enthusiasts um, randomly walking here. Um, my question, um, maybe a bit naive, but just out of curiosity, the first question is um, whether Myanmar, did Myanmar really have an option to postpone the election? Um, because like, we know that they're going ahead with the election, but did it really have an option or is barred by the constitu Constitution? Or it did have an option, but chose to ignore the option. This, this is just my, my, my main, like really, I'm just really curious about this. The second question is that, um, Gosai particularly, what do you think of Wu Ye Min Wu? Could, could he be the, could he, could he be the, the you know, like because he has grown, you know, the, the, his popularity is being, you know, I would say skyrocketed in the social media in Myanmar, Wu Ye Min Wu from um, the Gong Tao Shep, who I think um, could be the, the next candidate for the, you know, the Yangon, the Yangon governor. So what do you think he could, could he be a possible, you know, interesting candidate for, I don't know, like the successor for the NLD? What, what, what's your opinion on this? Thank you. Uh, for the first question is the postponement of the election. We, we, we do not have a, a specific, I mean like, we do not have a specific date for the election, but uh, in the constitution it states that uh, the current parliament 
the part the time of the parliament is just five years. So the the the, the parliament the, the current parliament were expire in in the end of the January. So if we want or if necessarily there is a, a chance or opportunity or there is a room to postpone until the early January, if necessarily. Uh, but other than that, beyond the January 31st, uh, we don't, it will be, uh, it will need to go to the, con the constitutional code of, we need to interpret the constitutions. How are we going to proceed without having uh, parliament? We may still have the president and the vice president and then, and then, the, and then the, the, the government, but we, not, we may not necessarily have the parliament. So that's something we need to interpret in terms of the constitutions. We need to clarify on that. So that's why the, but one of the interesting thing is that when we're talking about the postponement of the election, we have 92 party running in this election. There are some party, majority of them are in the region. They are likely to propose to perform, postpone the election. But there are some party which is mainly based in the ethnic part, ethnic area. They were worrying about, they concerned about, they were talking about uh, the movement of their candidate, but they're not necessarily talking about to do the postponement. So kind of mixed uh, uh, perception on whether we should postpone or not. So that's something uh, we never comes uh, to get the consensus. That's why we've been pushing uh, the UEC and political party to have a consensus whether we should go we should go ahead with the with with the with the date or whether we postpone until we prepare we prepare, we we pre we have a, a, a enough preparation for the for the elections. So that's my 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 take on that first question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he is quite popular since he's being transferred from Nepiro to Yango. People, a lot of people were talking about. Uh, like he might be tipping for the next uh, chief minister. I know you know that. I mean, in this country, a lot of things are. We, we it is very difficult to. I mean, like 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 foresee what is going to happen. You will see that at uh, Ushui man. I mean, people were talking a lot of talking about. And then I mean, at the end of, at the end of the day, so uh, Ushui man comes up with a different political party. So uh, I don't want to predict that. So you you know, there will be a lot. Of, there a, a lot can happen in in the last minute. But I mean, you you are true. Uh, you are you are correct. He is now very popular uh, in, in Yango at this point. Right. Would uh, I just want to ask? Would one of you care to put that him in perspective for uh, people in the room who may not be totally up on who he is? I I think Kosai probably knows more than we do. Yeah, he is the he he is, is serving a uh, deputy uh, mayor of Nepiro. He's suddenly not necessarily an uh, NLD party member. Uh, he worked for uh, two trading for some time and kind of like he's quite related to the two group. And then he was appointed to the um, deputy mayor uh, of Nepiro. And then now he just been appointed at the uh, Ministry of Planning or, or Finance in Yango. And then I mean like I, the current chief minister, Ufio Minde, a we're not running in this election, and then the transfer of, of Uyamin to Yango made people speculation about he might be uh, for the future, for the next uh, chief minister of Yango. That's uh, the story is going at this in Yango at this point. Right, and NLD member. You know what? Sorry. No, not not a party member. Uh, at this, he's now, he's now. But I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that he's not kind of like like the long-term party member. Mm, yeah. Mm, mm. Oh, thank you for that. Um, any other uh, of you want to comment on that question? No, the option to postpone or anything like that. Um, I I think this was talked about a lot several weeks ago when the surge really hit. And as Kosai said, you know, the last date that you can hold election has to be before 31st of, of January. So there were, there were several options. They could have actually done it. Um, but I think it's clear now that they're going to barrel right ahead. And right. I, I think they've missed their fail-safe point to actually um, postpone the election. And I think the amount of bargaining that they would have had to have done to achieve that. Right. Um, and if the UEC had been actually stronger, they could have said, our strong recommendation is this. Um, and one thing to watch, I think, related to that is how many cancellations um, are announced because of COVID. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and I think because of the COVID surge, the voting in Yangon, um, which will most likely go in a landslide to the NLD, is going to be far more complicated by people doing advanced voting and then over 60 people voting in some townships in some days. It's going to get very, very complicated very quickly. But cancellations being what? Cancellations of polls or... You, mean- you can... There's, there's... Well, now I guess there's probably three cancel- cancellation um, uh, forms. There's... <clears throat> Uh, the cancellations that we know of, which is the four townships of the, the United Wa State Army enclave and uh, the Mung La enclave in East, Eastern Shan State, we know that there are no voter lists there. The UEC is not there, so you can't have it. Then there's um, partial cancel- cancellations, which is village tracks within townships. Um, uh, and that means that, that if the, township, the rest of the township votes, those, those village tracks don't get to vote. And then there's full townships um, in which they're cancelled and then the UEC has to announce by-elections. And then a third... And basically that's decided by the UEC and then the Tatmadaw, the military, gives recommendations on security grounds to the Ministry of Home Affairs which then instructs the UEC that they can't conduct it there. So, for example, two whole townships in Northern Shan were cancelled in in 2015 and subsequently had by-elections. Um, and there's a third um, element now, which would be COVID um, cancellations. You know, we, we simply can't safely conduct the elections there. And, and that, I think, is going to become clearer, um, I guess, from now, right, well, Kosai? I mean, the, the, the UEC is talking about it in the next couple of weeks. The security cancel- cancellations because of conflict will probably come at the last minute because of yeah. the... the um, the social blowback because of that. And I think the places to watch there is Rakhine State and parts of Shan State and parts of, of, of Cayenne. Um, and Kachin as well, always, because of the... And, and Mon as well. Right. Yeah. Hey, we're talking yeah. about potentially quite a lot of cancellations, actually, and plus you've, you've mentioned it, the it, IDPs, it, uh, displaced people, and it sounds like lots of cancellations coming up. Yeah, in, in 2015, we have um, about 600 village track has been cancelled. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Franz, please identify yourself. Along go Mingalaba. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Very interesting. Uh, Francisco Starmedi, I work for Henry's Bell Foundation, and I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia. So there is this one thing that's been bothering me. What about the unelected military appointees? <laughs> the the seat warmers there's 166 of them in the parliament you know so my question I think this is something that the Myanmar Tamado learned from the Indonesian military mm-hmm. so I would like to ask definitely this cycle there is no talk about a reform yeah but and I I believe NLD is under hosted so they will give this uh, uh, a quarter uh, free seats in the military so but. Is there any, has been any discussion about this reform to put the military out of the parliament? Yeah, thank you. Democracy, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's quite a question, Franz. Yes. Uh-huh. So, who wants to take that on first? Uh, Kosai. Kosai first, <laughs> and then we follow. <laughs> I, I mean, there, there has been a lot of discussion since day one uh, about to... to to pushing out the military, 25% of the military from the parliament. Uh, yeah, I mean, we learn from Indonesia, but we are better than Indonesia. So there's no limited time for them and to do <laughs> moving out from the parliament. Well, so, so military stay safe in, in the parliament. So, I mean, the NLD has been proposing some kind of, I don't know whether it's, 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 it, it was not on the table at the end of the day, but they've been talking about uh, a kind of like scheduling uh, for the the, 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 the 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 reducing the number of the of the can of the military representative from the parliament by year by year. That has been said, but there were a lot of uh, a lot of people has been talking about this. So the, pe- some people were talking about like whether we we could change within the parliament, or whether we should be changing from the peace process, or whether we should be changing in from the social movement. But I mean, uh, stay from. For, I mean, until now, it's, it's, there is no 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 chance or no indicators that the military will be moving out out from the from the parliament. When you look at it, the speeches speeches from uh, at the of the 21st century uh, panel by the the commander in chief. So the the, the commander in chief never talked about of uh, the. Uh, he he always said that. Uh, 
Oh, they they are they will be ready to moving out from the out from the politics when the country is ready. So it seems that the country is not ready yet. So it seems that uh, it's it's not the time at this point. Right. Thanks. Um, okay. Anyone else? Yep. Yes. Uh, uh, I well uh, maybe back to the first question about who will be lie up. Uh, I I think if you if we look at the, the way like that uh, I think or I uh, maybe you can you argue or maybe add me uh, the way I see the NLD in terms of those who are lie up to replace or successor. It's just like the way that they look at like okay who will be the vice president or who will be the chief minister of Mandalay uh, of Yang uh, uh, or chief minister of Yangon. But in that way, the way they give the power, economic power of those chief minister to decide about a lot of the project, will it be considered as a possibility of the running up of the second generation, or is it only, I mean, economic project? Does it? No, I, I don't think so. Economy is not. I mean, definitely. Uh, that could be something, but that, not, that is not necessarily about the main point. Because, you know, when people look at the NLD, and NLD is still a very embedded in, in the majority of the Burma people. When, when they see a, a NLD, NLD has been in the front line, even though we have ADA generation, even though we have a different forces uh, uh, fighting the authoritarian regime, but NLD has been portrayed as a front line of the people. So, so I don't, it, it's, it, it will be very difficult for NLD just considering the economic perspective for the succession. Right. And, uh, mm -hmm. yes, please, identify yourself. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Seth Kane. I'm at the University of Washington. Um, this is a question a little bit more about the uh, election in terms of uh, what's going to happen in the ethnic states. I mean, the, the one, it appears one element of the rise of the AA and a lot of the violence that's occurred in uh, Rakhine State was a result of Arakan parties doing quite well in Rakhine State, but then being denied, of course, uh, any power to, uh, you know, that reflect their their good performance and the extent to which in this election the ethnic parties are getting their act together in various ways, uh, may perform better, especially at the state level, but then most likely will again be denied uh, by the NLD, notwithstanding their mandate to actually grant them some power in the state uh, to, to relegate them again to um, having no power could potentially uh, uh, contribute to you know various conflict actors making a case for you know stronger action or various causal pathways that that could lead to increased or different dynamics of a violent conflict. I was wondering the extent to which you think that might be plausible in, in the other states. Right. That, yes, maybe. I mean, I think you made your own point. I mean, I think it's very risky for the. I think the ethnic parties will do will likely do better. How much better we don't know exactly, and at what levels, at state or or, or union level. But um, but yeah, I think it's very risky for that to happen, and then for them not to be able to, for example, choose the chief minister or have the chief minister come from that party or or have some other you know uh, significant influence over um, over state affairs. So I think that's yeah, it's, it's very risky. Um, and as you say, I mean. Was, yeah, there was a level of causality between the exclusion of the of the AMP from um, from any doing anything really at the state level in Rakhine State and the and the and the, the terrible escalation we now see. Um, the Arakan Army and and and, and two other significant um, ethnic armed organisations are also excluded from the nationwide ceasefire agreement. So that's another factor I think which contributed to a sense of exclusion um, at that time. I th I think, just quickly to add on to that, I think the argument that there's the electoral outcome then the political outcome um, uh, really plays into things like this about, you know, what, what kind of rewards do we get um, when, you know, the, 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 the national government um, holds the keys to the, to the constitution um, when we've done well? I mean, in 2015, the AMP repeatedly said, we will do well enough that we can choose the chief minister. 
Um, and you hear that in Shan State and, and, and other places now. So if that's denied, I think then the political um, fallout from, from the election will just be, um, I think, more, I wouldn't say extremism, but more disappointment and um, more disappointment in the political system. Um, and, and I think that, that's driving a lot of people in, in different parts of the country to see armed re revolt is the only answer. And, and Rakhine's setting a very bad example for the rest of the country mm. in that way. And I think the, the, the national government, Aung San Suu Kyi, and the military should take um, some of the blame for that. Thank you. Yep. I may add a little bit on the constitution. I remember that in January last year, the uh, MP uh, of the NLD talking about changing a lot of uh, article in the constitution and they talk a lot and then disappear. And I don't know, <laughs> disappear, that's true, that's disappear. And then I don't know whether because of the, I mean, negotiation between the government and the military or what, but if you look at, I mean, in terms of the content in the article that the NLD proposed to change, I think basically it still doesn't go to what you call substantive democratization, but more on the division of power that who will have this and who will have that. And that's a sad story. But I mean, will the 2020 uh, the 2020 will NLD use the issue of changing constitution again as the way to win the people? Maybe yes, but I think the issue is that what will be in the content and at the moment the content is still not going for what you call full uh, democratization but it's still on the how to deconcentrate our power or sharing power. And I think this is a key issue both in the constitution and in the peace process. Just, just one very quick thing to add. If you want to get a sense of um, the political divisions in the country, look at the list of proposed constitutional amendments that the NLD pursued um, last year. Then look at this huge document um, that, that some of the ethnic political parties proposed. And the Mon Unity Party, um, the Shan Nationalities League for Democracy, and the Arakan National Party basically wanted to change almost every single line of the Constitution. Um, and also to, to think that there are divisions within the NLD and other Bamar political parties about the extent of, um, of, of constitutional reform. Um, and one figure to remember here is, is one of the, the main lawyers um, of, of, of the NLD, Ukoni, who was assassinated at, at, at the airport. Um, four years ago. Um, I spoke to him many times and he would say, my recommendation is just write a new constitution. But the NLD are kind of split on, on how to do this. And so the extent of constitutional reforms and what it means for um, the peace process, what it means for, for ethnic unity, I mean, all of these things um, is really determined on, on, on the extent of constitutional reform. And it doesn't seem as if the NLD is serious about doing that, except for the provisions that help them. And, and I think that's really unfortunate. There's been no real national conversation about constitutional reform. Right. Very good point. Um, well, I think uh, that might wrap it up, but I'd like to give all of you, each of you, a chance if you have a final thought on, um, well, really, maybe a, a bit of a prediction or what you would, you know your expectation or, you know, sense of what's in store. I mean, would you like to kick that off, Kosai? Just a very brief sum up of, you know, <laughs> your hope um, or fear or your main, you know. <laughs> it seems that uh, with the current legal framework, with the current uh, political situations, with the COVID situation, the 2020 elections will be uh, a lot of flaw, uh, may not necessarily be, uh, ex the, the result may not necessarily be uh, the satisfying to everybody. But one thing we have to understand is that, uh, as I s mentioned earlier, this is one of the, the, one of the key important political process for our political journey. So that's something in, there are, I, I think that uh, even though the the poli I, 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 I just wanted to also echo what David just said, said that I mean the election outcome may not necessarily be the, the represent 
the same with the political outcome. But that is something if we can and run the election pretty well, that could be a kind of a, a, a starting point or initial point to move another step. If we can't organize elections pretty well, that will be a, a, a kind of worrying situation for our, our, our future political process. That's, that's what my, 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 my thought uh, at this point. Right. Thank you. Um, Vanessa. <laughs> Difficult to, uh, well, to conclude. Well, fear, hope, expectation. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, I think I think in terms of the process itself, yeah. I mean, I think we'll see a relatively low turnout because of COVID, um, and an even lower turnout in ethnic areas because of disillusionment, as we've we've just talked about. Um, but I, I mean, there are you know the things that give hope. I think are, are really in the yeah in the consolidation of the ethnic parties and the the real um, enormous effort that they've put into this process. Um, um, whether or not that that translates into votes and and, and seats is another question. Um, um, but, um, but yeah, and as Kosai said, this is a really important step. Myanmar is very um, young in its in its journey on in in terms of democratisation and peace process. So um, yeah, this is this is a step along the road, and I, I hope for the best. Right, great, thank you. Um. <laughs> I think he's continuing the tradition okay. of being the la having the yes, last word. Uh, yeah. Well, for me, I'm sit in the situation with possible no election. So at least for me, election, <laughs> it better than nothing. Even uh -huh. though this uh, election okay. will be credible or not, at least you fight with the competitive, I mean, through the election. Right. The point is that whether people changing, I feel that the previous election, uh, the 2015 is look at what I call common enemy. So you go for the election to fight against the military. But this time, this is not the issue of common enemy. This is the enemy within. So basically, this is will be, I hope, this is my hope, high hope, that maybe uh, the issue, I mean, right now, is, uh, this is the October, so it's around one month before the election. I hope that at least the platform before the election should go on a certain policy or a certain issue process rather than only the vote. I know that we cannot change much for the vote. People may vote, I mean, the way it is, but rather than low turnout, at least should try to find something with the policy issue. But, and I feel that this is maybe a request to our civil society that cause I work, that rather than differentiate I mean, rather than feel hopeless and stay at home and see that the world doesn't, I mean, reflect the reality, but maybe this is some way to change. And for me, in that context, even though the NFD is so strong, but at least you still have the make the voice heard. So for me, I hope for the better, both with the ethnic and also the social issue, because otherwise it will be very a new way of monopolization, and yes. I don't want that way. Yeah. Thank I you. Think you. I think you made the point. So when you look at it 2020, you may see that a lot of political party comes up with the, the campa campaign platform, party platform, that we have never seen in 2015. SNRD, CNLD, and other political party, they just started to, to approaching and the people, not only identity, also the policy and it. So I mean, that's, that's kind of like positive thing. I, I just want to add it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, Dave. Just, what's it? I mean, just very quickly, I, I fear that with this COVID outbreak and, and the seeming inability of, of the authorities to actually handle it, um, then, um, then the results, especially in, in, in Yangon, um, uh, will be quite mixed. But I'm far more worried about a public health disaster. As, as a result of, of, of the elections. Um, because I don't think that there's any clear lines of cooperation between the government, the Ministry of Health and Sports, and, and the UEC and, and local level officials to actually handle this well. Already, there's a great deal of confusion about where you go, extra polling stations, PPE, all of these, these kind of things. And, and the fact that you have the state councillor um, observing very closely, multiple times, um, uh, the performance art of the polling station and, and saying that she has problems with it. So she's micromanaging um, a lot of this. And I think that's, that's quite a recipe for disaster. Um, and, um, and, and I don't think that they've got enough time to actually get it right, um, unfortunately. OK, so let's just say that you've got a very low bar, which is just for it to come off without 
mass infections and public health disaster. If, 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 if 10% of people don't get infected or, or even more um, and, and large amounts of people don't die, then, then that would be a relatively successful part of the election. <laughs> right. OK. Maybe um, we should have a post-election uh, analysis evening at some point <laughs> and we can all come back and evaluate. Anyway, I'd um, really like to thank uh, all of you, actually, and particularly you, Kosai, sitting there in the middle of uh, Yangon, and good luck. And um, to all our panellists, thank you very much, and to all of you for turning up tonight. There's a, a nice protest out there for a, um, some uh, different kind of political action if you want uh, just outside after this uh, event. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Kosai. Take care. Thank you.